For our scripture reading today, we'll hear it sung, Matthew chapter 6 or Luke 11, the Lord's Prayer. We've been reading for six weeks now. Today, finally, at the end of the series, we get to hear it. Please enjoy Daphne Leon and her uncle, Elvin Rodriguez. temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the Thank you, thank you, Daphne and Elvin. That's the song we know well. Today we come to the last part of the Lord's Prayer. But first, let me ask a question. Someone listening today, please tell me, please tell this friend that you can relate to what I'm about to tell you. Please tell me that I have company, and here's the summary. I did my laundry several, several weeks ago. I took the wet things from the washer, put them on hangers, took them out to the backyard to dry because saving energy during these rolling blackouts, right? And it's, what, 120 degrees outside. I walked back indoors to sit down in front of the Zoom and look over my shoulder. I looked over my shoulder. I noticed my laundry hanging outside. I looked at my laundry hanging outside. What do you notice? <laughs> my work attire has shifted during work from home. Has this happened to any of you? Please tell me someone gets this. Drop me a comment where you're watching today. This is what my work attire now looks like, working from home. I know I'm supposed to get up and get dressed and get dressed properly for the church office here and go sit in front of the Zoom station. And, and also, why? Why? I noticed this pattern trending. Trend, this pattern was trending after I did my laundry for a few weeks, I, I, for a few months. I, I'm wearing T-shirts all the time. When did that happen? I've thoroughly cleaned my closet now. I've donated most of the dry cleaning required clothes, and I've saved a few blouses for meetings where people have expectations of pastors and something other than, you know, t-shirts. 
I can rotate these three or four blouses and keep a couple of blazers. My work from home attire is, now looks like what? What is that? Simplicity? Uh, you can tell I'm a little bit loyal. Uh, might be from La Sierra if three out of the six shirts say La Sierra, right? Literally, I get up and shower, grab a t-shirt, and oh, by the way, a couple of three pairs of black leggings have done me well during shelter at home. I mean, that's it. The first few months of working from home, these t-shirts and these leggings, that, that was it. Grab your outfit, get your coffee, go to the Zoom station, because that's what you do. When an important meeting comes around, I just change T-shirts to the, you know, a nice blouse. I sit back down in front of the computer. When it's over, I put my T-shirt back on. It uh, didn't take a lot of deliberate planning. It really kind of happened. Put on a T-shirt, grab a pair of leggings, go to work. It's a little bit like this. The, we're now at the ending of the most important prayer in the life of Christianity, the Lord's Prayer. And a curious thing has happened. It's as, it's as basic as grabbing a t-shirt and a pair of leggings and getting on with it. Let's just get it done. L let me show you how I see that. What's your preferred Bible translation? What's the translation you go to? Say it out loud where you're watching today. Does your family know the translation that you prefer? We've been reading from the, the King James Version for this series. Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer is what we've been reading. So let's go to that one last time from the New Revised Standard Version. Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. You notice, right? You, no you notice that it stops before it's over. Where's the ending? Well, so maybe it's in Luke. So, so go ahead, move over quickly to Luke chapter 11. Whatever translation you're reading, Luke chapter 11 records the same prayer, beginning with verse 2. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us into the time of trial. It also stops before it's over. Where in the world is the ending we say out loud together? Where is the ending we know so well? It, it must be in one of the other translations. So go ahead, check your preferred translation and compare notes. Most all of them, we will find out, have the same scenario. The prayer simply stops. Who, who ends a prayer by telling God not to take us into times of trial? That's not an ending. That's just a stopping. I had a sermon like that once, actually, where I said, I don't know how the sermon end, ends, so I'll just stop, because I legitimately didn't know how to end. We heard Daphne and Elvin share this beautiful rendition of the Lord's Prayer. Can you imagine Daphne's song stops rather than ends? Listen again as Paul cues up a few measures for us, uh, the lead us not to temptation part. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver. We can't imagine this song without an ending. Where is the ending we memorized that's written into every song featuring the Lord's Prayer? Okay, so you King James only friends, this is your moment to shine. Go ahead and sit up straight. Don't become, you know, puffed up. Just hold your head up high. This is your moment because it turns out in your translation, your preferred rendering, the King James, verse 13 has a second part to it, part B. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There it is. There it is. Closure. And for those of us who favor Eugene Peterson's Bible, his paraphrase where he uses his own words to interpret the, the texts, he also takes the lead from the King James translators. He decides to give the prayer a proper ending. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. It's called a doxology, a glory saying about God, and this is what it sounds like to end a prayer properly. Somebody gave the prayer an ending. Who? It's not totally clear, nor is it at all troublesome. 
what we do know is that the ending to the Lord's Prayer is absent from the oldest manuscripts um, from which our Bible is translated, which is why in the King James Version, it's why it's there, but not in most of the other translations. Not because the King James is more accurate, but because it's tied to different manuscripts. Not because the King James is superior, it's different. Since the translations of the King James, more manuscripts have been unearthed in significant archaeological finds. And these older manuscripts, they don't seem to carry this doxology. It's missing. Okay, what does that mean? There's not really any dispute about this among scholars. Jesus likely didn't teach the disciples this part of the prayer. It's more probable that the community added the ending. And don't shoot the messenger, really. This isn't a problem. These are important truths to tell about the Bible, especially our children. We don't want them to be surprised one day, their trust in Scripture undermined, right? We'll be spending eternity understanding the Bible. And if archaeologists dig up something new tomorrow about Jesus, I want to know. Jesus likely ended the prayer with the disciples that day with simply the phrase, deliver us from evil. It takes the disciples about a hundred years before they collectively say, hey, we need to get a proper ending. We, we can't just end it this way. It happened probably without a lot of deliberation either. And then for hundreds of years, people experimented with endings to the Lord's Prayer. The history and experience with Jewish prayers told them prayers need endings, and proper endings sound like doxology, glory sayings about God. The Bible's full of doxologies. They're added usually to the end of prayers throughout Scripture, from Deuteronomy to 1 Chronicles to Psalms to 1 Peter to Revelation. Here's why I think this is so creative. Different groups in different regions in different periods of time, they tried out different endings. If you want to trace them all, it's mildly chaotic, says one scholar. From the 2nd to the 15th century, they're playing with endings like, Amen, or for yours is the power until the ages of ages, or for yours is the power and the glory. That's common among ancient Jewish prayers. Or how about this one? For yours is the kingdom and the glory. That's a little familiar. Or for yours is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to the ages. Amen. Uh, somebody who likes words wrote that ending. Or for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. That last one becomes the most widely used popular ending to the Lord's Prayer and the one picked up by the King James translators. It's a mildly chaotic development, the doxology. You know what I love about this, though? Humans had these widespread instincts that this prayer should end by naming God, not evil. Humans had this instinct that something more could be said, something more ought to be said. Humans had to sing the most basic words in their history, not fancy words, not overdone words, not the dress blouse, not the fancy clothes, not the suit and tie, go into a party kind of clothes. It's a basic t-shirt and leggings ending, really. Humans needed to express the most basic truth. The glory of God is in the center of the universe. Amen. I think this is phenomenal. So the disciples of Jesus, they learned to pray the Lord's Prayer then three times a day because once is apparently not sufficient. I, I learned to sing doxology when I was a little kid. We always sang doxology in church when the offering was collected as if, as if, as if a thank you over the offering. That old doxology many of us know from worship gatherings, 17th century. It's first written for... Um, a boys' school, and they sing it several times a day also. Singing doxology several times a day, this is part of the early pattern of what to do with these glory singing, sayings. When we sing doxology, we witness to a different world, a world that belongs to God. Friends, there's so much we could say this particular Sabbath. We could dive deep into different things right now, and I'm aware that our attention span is tapped. We've had a week after a few months and into a year. When I selected the Lord's Prayer for our sermon series this fall, I knew November 3 would coincide. I knew we'd be coming to the end of the prayer on this particular week, and I've been listening and praying. What is it the Lord's Prayer might have to say to us this particular week in our nation's history? 
And then also I have the voice of Andy, Standy, Andy Stanley, a pastor here in the States from Atlanta, Georgia. Earlier this year, he shared a story from 2016, a different election year. It was a Sunday after elections, and he tells of a woman who came to visit his church in Atlanta. When church was over, he was scrolling through his Twitter feed and reading reflections, and he came across one from a woman who had been in his church. And she tweeted, I came to church looking for reassurance. I'm scared. No one even mentioned the elections. I feel abandoned by my church. And this is our ridiculous reality. Various degrees of tiptoeing going on, specifically in Adventism right now. If, if we name what's going on in our country, we offend someone. If we remain silent, we wound others. And while the church is not the arena of the world, the world out there is the arena of the church, the world God so loves. Christians can, in this moment, clarify our witness. I'm finishing the sermon this week with power collisions on display in our country. While I'm finishing our sermon, I can see officials gathered inside buildings counting ballots and protesters angry, some of them armed. We're used to seeing these scenes from other countries and nations, but this is becoming familiar here now. We can stop with the thought that Jesus was not political. We can actually stop that line of thinking. The Lord's Prayer is a summary of everything Jesus taught. It draws a line on this faulty idea. Praying for the kingdom of God to arrive is the most political prayer you could pray. We're with Jesus who showed what kingdom and power and glory looks like. And it started with a teenage mom and an unmarried, uh, unmarried parents. We're with Jesus who sleeps in a stable, a manger his first night on earth. His parents are displaced immigrants under the rule of a hostile dictator. We're with Jesus. His earthly possessions are counted in people, not things. He takes meals in bad com company and he touches broken, contaminated bodies. We're with Jesus. He rides a donkey for his inauguration and it, and it ends in ridicule and treason and torturous capital punishment with a sign above his head, King of the Jews, and the palace police spitting on his body. We're with Jesus. The Christian church could clarify its witness in this cultural moment. For me, the compare and contrasting pictures that we've shared here over the years, Alexander the Great on the back of his black stallion or Jesus on the back of a nursing mother donkey. Both of them enter Jerusalem in parades. The visuals, the comparisons, the contrast, they don't get more startling than this. We're with the guy on the donkey who chose the nonviolent justice. N.T. Wright says of this last petition of the Lord's Prayer, if the church isn't prepared to subvert the kingdoms of this world with the kingdom of God, the honest thing to do is to give up praying this prayer, particularly the final doxology. When we sing doxology, it's really very simple. When we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow, we put God back in the center of the universe. God's enthroned in God's rightful place. Doxology announces that the world is filled with God's faithful love, that the world is God's. Whatever pretend power and self-centered power, insecure power that we see embodied or on display, it's not God. Doxology then closes the gap between where we currently live and the world God is asking us to make. When we sing Doxology Church, we witness to a different world, and that, that world belongs completely to God. And it's small steps from singing Doxology to embodying and becoming and living Doxology in our world. We find strength when we do this to keep on, to keep on, to keep on. I, I don't have much more wisdom for this Sabbath after elections, after this tumultuous week in our country. I don't have much more beyond what I'm saying right now. If Christians do nothing more than bless and praise and thank God with our lived lives, if the church does nothing more than announce the sovereignty of God, announce that love will overcome every form of evil, We've done what God asks of us, and we've exercised transformational power. The most powerful choices you and I can make right now in light of the mess, of our, the mess in our nation, 
the most transformational choices, the most powerful choices we can make are actually also the most subversive choices. Announce the reign of God and then live like we believe it. This is not time to be afraid. Don't be, don't be afraid. Feel afraid, okay, and be accountable. Accountable to the kingdom of God. Thinking doxology, it's one of the ways we take the next steps this week. I remember years ago, years ago, talking with a church member, Eva. She was one of our second row ladies. You remember Eva Bowen. I don't remember the specific tragedy. She was driving uh, after something chaotic and terrible had happened in her life. And she's, she told me when she got here to the church, Pastor, I, don't, I, I don't even, didn't even know. I didn't even know that my mouth was moving and my voice was going. I pulled the car into the church parking lot and, and I heard the car filled with music. It, it was me. And I was singing doxology. I sang and I sang and I sang until eventually my tears dried. It turns out Jesus teaches us to pray a prayer that will save us in times like these. Sing doxology. <laughs> 